Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I'm excited to introduce you to a marketing tech leader. Daniel Melkerson started and is a former CEO and now board member of Pin Me Too. Pin Me Too is a location marketing platform for multi location enterprises, including Starbucks, DHL, HM, 7 Eleven, Volvo, Hertz, you name it. If you're in retail, you will know some of their customers. Daniel, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Daniel, a couple of fun things. We love interviewing B2B marketers, B2B sales leaders, B2B CEOs and founders like yourself. And one of the things that people don't typically associate with B2B is the cool factor. You're the ultimate opposite of B2B in your earlier career. You were, kind of a, were a band member, you are specialized in surfing and skateboarding. Tell us, you ran an experience agency. Tell us about how do you make B2B fun was given like this the history of just on a personal level, doing all these fun things earlier in your life and career. I think it's because I always I always said to myself, never get too old to suck at something new. And so I always try to do new things that I haven't done before and see what happens. So that's why I have 12 companies behind me and I think only three succeeded. <laughs> that's how it is. And this time around when we started Pin Me Too, and this is 10 years now ago, so it's been a while, was more because the other companies and everything I've done in my life has been self-funded or funded together with other people that I started things with. And this time I wanted to do something within tech. I wanted to do it with technology, building it with uh, other developers, start the companies with developers because I've never done that. And I also wanted to understand how the how VC, VC money works, how, in, how it is to start a money with, with someone else's money, so to say. So we really didn't have any idea on what to do. And then I had this experience agency before, as you said. And we had some customers within the tourism industry and so on. So we, okay, let's see if we can build some tech here. So we started out there, yeah. It sounds like you succeeded. So the brands that you work with are who is who in the retail and you know yep. multi-location space universe. It's a, it's in our experience in larger companies, it's hard to break into some of these names yeah. and i certainly you started as a startup so yeah. what have you learned about find building relationships and you're not also your company is not based in silicon valley you're, you're based in sweden while sweden is known for generating great outcomes it may not be as easy in some cases to be seen oh. as a enterprise software leader from sweden so i'd love to hear some of the challenges that you had on that journey and what are the reasons you, you've been successful? First of all, I think it's the classic world, grit, never give up. There's no, okay. I always, there's no, I try to burn my bridges behind me. So I, there's only one way to go. Are you completely screw this up or you succeed really well? And that's what I did. I pretty much left everything else. So that's the first thing to really focus the other thing is to, I think what we did, and that's a good thing about Sweden and smaller countries in general, I think, is that first make sure that you're something on your home market. We did the same mm -hmm. thing when I started the band back then. We were from a really small city with 30,000 people living in it. And then we said, okay, let's make sure that everybody in the age group that we are attracting with the music, kind of music we mm -hmm. do, will come to our concert. And if we can do that, then we can probably do the same thing in other cities around Sweden. And we did the same thing with Pin Me Too. We made sure that we nailed what's in Sweden. So at first we made sure, as you said, we're working with multi-location chain businesses. So we started out with the, the ones that are famous brands in Sweden, not okay. global, not outside Sweden, just in Sweden. And we tried to get them on board and we got an investor on board there, an uh, industrial investor that actually owned quite a lot of these, and like a group that owned quite a lot of grocery stores and stuff like that. So we got them as investor and then we could get into this. Even they were big brands, we got in like the back door because they invested in the company as well. So we nailed that. We got all really big brands quite fast. I think in the first three years, we got really known brand in Sweden within three years with some hard work and sales and negotiations and <laughs> some investments in, and so on. And then we, okay, let's do the same thing globally. What, how's, what's the easiest way to do that? Okay, let's see if we can get the big global known brands in, that are head office in Sweden. 
Right. So we focused on them. So I think I had 40, 50 meetings with different people at H&M into the back door again. 40, so, 50 meetings, right? So to yeah. break into, you H&M, know, unfortunately, yeah. my kids love H&M. So thank you for making, <laughs> they would even go shop for that in any place. <laughs> so it sounds like you're bringing consistent experience across markets there. Yeah. But to get, and for you, H&M would have been life and death, right? Because yeah. you go global, there's only that many kind of true, fortunately, Sweden is great for retail businesses, yeah. but in general, there's only that many global Swedish brands and H&M was just going to be the yeah. success. It's, it, 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 it's the, yeah, it's the superstar within the industry yeah. we are approaching. So that was, I was just, I, I have to do, I have to get this. So, and you had to do it as a CEO, kind of founder. You had more yeah, heft yeah, 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 yeah. to go and break into. So 40, 50 meeting. Did you feel like this was a traditional enterprise sales process or was more just strategic founder? We're going to build this together with you type of approach that, that you've taken. Like in my experience, yeah. sometimes it was the larger organizations that we've been fortunate enough to work with the traditional selling didn't work as well when you're early as did more, hey, let's let's co-design this together. What has been your kind of lesson in breaking through? Yeah, and in in the early days was, I was the sales guy and the other two that I founded the company, we was building the product. So I had to, for product market fit, it was only us three for the first one and a half, two years, because we tried a little bit of different things before we nail it as well, what we're going to do. Uh, then I, 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 we hired another salesperson that it was quite similar to me, which I knew I, if I say, okay, run in this direction, try to close deals with these brands, I knew that he will be the kind of person that will figure it out. And he's actually still around, so amazing that he is. Uh, and then we did that and had some more people growing like that. But then, after, of course, after a few years in, we started building a process. So now we have SDRs, we have quota carriers that hands over to onboarding and CS and so on. So we have a much scalable and structured sales process. But since we're approaching big companies, our outbound compared to inbound is 80-20. 80% of everything we close. It's pure, outbound. much more enterprise sales approach, even in the markets yeah. where, where you're well known. You yeah. can't just sit there and just well, wait for people to reach out no, to you. No, 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 uh, no, no. And and that's interesting because you focused, right? Like you had like in a, in a kind of classical model, People say when you focus, you get some sort of a market effect, but it sounds even with a focus on a geography or on a particular kind of, you started with focusing first on the retail segments, you still needed to do mostly outbound. Yeah, we needed to, because not just, I think, because we're reaching out to big companies, but also that we are selling to marketing people and they usually take decisions as a team or we talk to a head of digital that has another boss and so on. And what we sell very often needs a meeting for them to really understand that they have the pain. Not so much now because the, the market is more educated, but as, as with every startup, to become something you need to be there in time. So very early on, we had to educate the market as well. So it's in our DNA as well. I think we could do more within uh, inbound now, but we have a really good outbound man- engine and it's safer for us to scale that way. Let's be direct, right? So you're in marketing and sales for your company. You sell to marketers, right? We yeah. have sometimes, that's one of our segments as well. And what have you found is great about selling to marketers? And what do you find that you hate about selling to marketers. <laughs> and let's say for our early discussion between the differences between Sweden and Denmark, let's <laughs> let you be the da- Danish person in this answer, right? Like, oh, yeah. uh, we're big for everybody around. Daniel lives in, in Malmo, which is just a bridge across yeah. Copenhagen and Denmark. And there's a, there, there's a, I, I have a lot of experience with some great Danish folks yeah. and Swedish folks and, and family living. And the gap that we see is just the, it's very close, but there is a culture yeah. of directness that, uh, that's in Denmark. So we want the direct, no bullshit. Right, you know, okay, what, you want the Danish drunk and the direct. Danish answer <laughs> from a Swedish person, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll try. So selling to marketers is great in that way because you and that they are conversational. They like to yeah. discuss and they like to talk about it and it's usually a lot of feelings involved it's so much easier to talk to a tech person because they just want to know what they can do with it 
So mm -hmm. the nice thing is that it, it's always a, a fun sales process, but uh -huh. it, it takes a little bit longer time because they are a team. It's not that they're just buying this little feature that's going to fix this little thing for me when I work. It's actually something that's going to fix something for the whole company and then for the whole market. Multiple team. chains. So you have, and the, in your case, is it just marketers that are making the buying decision or they also need to get the store decision makers, uh, like store level folks involved? We, the, we sell to the head office in 90% of the cases. Sometimes in franchise, they want to have the, it paid from different markets, but it's the head office that buys. Okay. So it's all, always the head office. But then there, are, there might be a lot of stakeholders to get involved to do the deal because there are, for example, we had H&M as an example. There are, there are 5,000 stores scattered all over the world. There are stakeholders involved. But we're trying to push that Close the deal and say, hey, you need to start from the top and you okay. set up the structure and then you involve the markets or whoever is responsible. Look afterwards, right? Like one, yeah. We'll, we'll do that in onboarding. Mm -hmm. So we, we are trying not to prolong the sales process, but by having too many involved from the customer. And say, so hey, so the, like, the positive side is easy to talk to. The hard side, long time yeah. to, to talk yeah. to. Anything else? They are very visual. That is something we, we see though. So for example, we, we're selling their online presence. So we can just do screenshots of, okay, you don't have opening hours for your stores in Spain, for example. And we see that on all your Google business profiles. Then we can just do screenshots and discuss that. And that works so much better than saying written in text or whatever, trying to explain the benefits of our product. So we can just show them in graphics. So show, not tell. So show, not tell. Oh, yeah, works really. But that well. means like you have to work a little bit harder and have more visually centric sales process. We need to be, process. yeah, we need a lot of quality in the sales process, which to me, can, it can be really easy, but, but to me, quality is that you talk about the customer. You don't talk about you. You don't talk about how great you are, what other customers you work with. You can do that in one slide. In, and then we always do that. We put in the customer's logo, and then from here on, we're just going to talk about you. And when SDRs books meetings, they find something to talk about the customer, not saying just, hey, we're here. Where are you? I want the meeting. It's look at, look at how pretty we are. So they find a challenge. They find the store in Spain that's missing the yeah, office yeah. hours and say, hey, yeah. did you know this? They yeah. screenshot it and then they go, here's how. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. show the problem and then talk about it in the way that the people care about. It. Anything else? No, it's exactly what you said there, because a lot of people and a lot in sales training and marketing schools and stuff, they say, don't talk about the customer's problem. I don't believe in that at all. You should focus 100% on their pain and their problem and just push it in their face. Sorry to say, I know sometimes we had an issue. I still don't have Ikea, <laughs> which is one of the larger Swedish brands that I need to have before I close down my part in Pinme too. It, and very early on, the problem was that we showed so many problems that they have done. So the person we tried to sell to felt a shame in front yeah. of their boss. Yeah, yeah. If we were in a physical meeting. This was before COVID, so there were physical meetings as well. Yeah. And I saw that person falling to the floor, like really down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that ended up in not in a good way, actually, because it turned into an internal issue. And they've been discussing for years now and not making a buying decision. So it can also... You were too Danish. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was too Danish selling to a Swedish company. Danish. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this is a really interesting because you brought up the issue of consensus, right? Yeah. And for those that are maybe not as familiar with European markets, so there's a history in Sweden that Sweden does has a reputation where decisions are made by consensus yeah and then you brought up that marketers also like to get more consensus and yeah. more buy and so how much do you think is that was experience and obviously you've sold in sweden but you're in like what 120 countries we're talking yeah we talking have customers in 120 countries 120 countries i'm really curious about the consensus culture and selling in the consensus driven culture selling in the cultures where you need to shake things up a little bit mm -hmm. have you seen the difference when you went away from sweet swedish market to other markets in terms of how you you go to market and how you sell we, we use the same process for selling but one thing that we've seen really important especially in europe 
uh, is that we see a lot better pro progress if we sell the person that are selling is not necessarily living in the country they're selling to, but are born and have the the language skills that are needed that have the like the culture, the culture uh, of yeah. selling. So we built we have our largest sales office is in Gdansk in Poland, but okay. I think we have. I don't know how many nationalities, but there's a lot of nationalities at that office that are selling. You basically other found market. a location that's reasonably affordable, but then yeah. you could you, you know, but it has to have an international presence yeah. enough Thanks. where people can be. And so you, Ireland, okay. Dublin used to be like that hub for many European companies yeah. where you could find the French and the, the Deutsche and et cetera. And, and why did you pick Dansk in, in particular? Because we moved in, we were, there were no player doing what we're doing in Poland. And Poland is a much larger country than you might think. And it's yep. a very, a country with a lot of chains in it because it's okay. chain business is a, a thing. So we started selling there. We had one. So it was just more from... initially, it was just a sales opportunity. Yeah. And then you said, yeah. hey, we like these folks. They're, they hustle. Yeah. It's a uh, yeah. yeah. It's a great yeah. area. There's three cities sitting next to each other, and there's a lot of universities, a lot of international people living there. Google has a big office there as well, and so on. And it's yes, it's 45 minute flight, or you take a boat from where we are in Malmo. So it's very close for us as well if we want to travel between. Okay, got it. That's really helpful. All right. So what what other Again, like it's a some of your customers are the envy of folks selling in B two B, but I think they're like you said they're marketers in like really sophisticated consumer brands. Yeah. They are being pitched by agencies like yourself in the past lives, myself yeah. in my past life, who yeah. are desperate to put that brand on their logo. Yeah. Agencies have an unfortunate, I think, history of doing work for free and marketers sometimes take advantage of that. Yeah. And so then you're selling software, enterprise software, it obviously takes more to deploy. And I've seen sometimes people a little bit confused, like the agents, the marketing buyers, they want to tra- treat software vendors a little bit like an agency. Hey, do this pilot, do this test, yeah, support yeah, yeah, this yeah. campaign. I'm yeah. curious if you've seen that and, and it's almost like, these guy, these agencies are gonna just go and that don't know how to sell themselves particularly well, go and create a bad set of bad habits for everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's my at least perception. Tell yeah. me, like, what have you seen and how have you managed to compete with free or do nothing in some cases in this environment? Yeah, we don't do that. If we do a pilot, it's a paid one. Because there, there are connections that needs to be done. There's a lot of work because we set up the, we have API connections to a lot of different large search maps and social media networks. So all of that needs to be set up. So there's a lot of work in the beginning for everything to work forever. So we explain that to the customer and there's a lot of work. If they want to do a pilot, we say, okay, let's do a pilot in this country then. And because you're in 18 others. And, we and you discount there. the pilots a little bit? Or are they still like, how do you manage the we, we, there's no, friction, we, right? Mm-hmm. We usually don't discount them. We say, okay, but let's take a, a lower number of your number of uh, stores or whatever location it might so be. So you do it by location. Got it. Yeah. And then we usually suggest to do a market. So it's a full, full market. And uh, say, hey, can we do this? Let's do the case only for Denmark, for example. We spoke a lot about that. And do you compete with agencies that are willing to go do little crazy stuff that doesn't scale or uh, not really being you're unique yeah. enough where it doesn't come up with you? It, it, the, the smart agencies and the larger agencies, they work for their com- for their, their customers in PinMe2. They use PinMe2 to, to achieve local SEO. Uh, Got it. Some agencies feel threatened, performance agencies. Oh, if they have this tool, they don't need that many hours from us. Mm-hmm. But that's on them. They, it usually yeah. turns out that the we because we always approach the end customer, uh, yeah. and when we work with an agency, it's just because the end customer asks us to more or less. And then sometimes for big, big media agency networks, they they tend to start liking us, and then they introduce us, which is great. But our aim goal is always to try to have a, an agreement with the end customer, and then we're more than happy to have agencies working for them in the platform. And, and we and don't tell, care if they charge whatever they charge. Or, we don't care. 
And guide me a little bit, like when you were building out your platform, Ryan, you had an agency hat beforehand. You built out your platform. Did you try to go to agencies at the very beginning as a kind of reselling, co-selling partner? Or did you go directly to brands? What have you yeah. learned from that journey? No, I've learned that before, pin me to that I, I don't go to agencies for partnerships. I go to other partners in that case. So I call them soft and hard partners. So soft partners, it's agencies that are selling their time by the hour. And more like a hard partner is another tech platform that has a technology that complements ours. And I think that kind of partnerships usually works out much better. Because the problem with agencies is that, is that they go where they can catch more, the most of the hours. And our whole idea is to give you, the customer kind of you, the efficiencies. Yeah. yeah, efficiency. So they don't have to spend all those hours because we built the tech instead. They pay for the tech. So I no, we haven't uh, done that. No. But for that. you, agencies are part of the ecosystem because they're embedded and they need to deliver it. Yeah. And sometimes they will not resist it. But you're yeah. not going through them. You're going to the brand and you're educating them. And yeah. you're saying, hey, look, get your agency to do um, work on more value-added yeah. stuff than the plugs. Is that kind of a... Yeah, yeah, that's usually how it works. We love the agencies. Uh, and I think they appre appreciate us as well because they can deliver a lot of value to their end customers with the tech we have. And they still can make money because they actually do their job for them. And they can create more visual reports or whatever they want to do. And so on. So it's a, a, hopefully a win with most agencies we work with. Got it. All right. Listen, let's do a quick round of questions. One of the one of the one of the quotes that we picked up when researching your background was an interesting one where you said something at a tech pond, which by the way, like we'll have those guys podcast yeah. about listening to investors and said, don't listen too much to other people, especially not investors, about advice on how to grow your business. It's your company. So I, I think one of the things that you deal with as an entrepreneur and your serial entrepreneur in this is you get this feedback whiplash, right? And some yeah. people with best intentions yeah, tell yeah, you, course. Daniel, you should really do this. And other people tell you, you should do this. Yeah. And some of them could be investors. Some of them could be well-wishers. Some of yeah. them could be future investors. And like, it's great. In some ways, I would say when you're running your thing, you're very close to it. You're a little too close. Yeah. So some third party, a little bit more objective perspective on it uh, does help. But yeah. ultimately, how did you navigate that? You have investors, you've reached a scale. Where did you find that external advice helpful? And where did you find that you just needed to ignore it? I think the most helpful thing from investors, we have both VCs and uh, we have one Indian investor. The best thing they have done is introduce you to people that you couldn't reach yourself because of their network, if I'm going to be 100% honest. And then, of course, knowledge when it comes now and we're a bit bigger, running a board, making sure we handle everything accordingly. But there's also been investors that they say, oh, you should go to this tech event. You should go there and raise more money. You should do this and you should do that. And, to, and we did it maybe once. But I think when they start doing that, you should do this. Right. Like either help me with something practical or yeah. go, you're not an operator. It's oh. cheap. You're like no. execution is where the value is. Can you deliver? Okay. Great yeah. advice. Yeah. What else did you do in terms of, we talked a little bit about, enterprise like being more sales led initially and now still what else are you doing in terms of your own growth that surprised you something that you didn't think you would be doing but you've tried it and it works really well and i would sounds like the dunks being a sales hub is like one of those things that you weren't planning on day mm -hmm. one to be prominent there yeah, no, I think we've done a lot of those things, actually. And I think one of the things you need to is take risk, but do it smart. Make sure that the risk is, it's like when you, you buy a lottery ticket or if you die, buy a few lottery, lottery tickets every year, make sure it's money you can waste and make sure that you have that kind of money in your company if you want to grow, because you need to take some opportunities from time to time. And some of them has been bad surprises and then some of them has been really nice like the Gdansk we just started to see if we could get my business in Poland and now we have an office with 40 people doing different things in different areas of the companies from a, from an office and it's great it's been a big success 
We're doing the same thing when we move into different countries. We start small, we find a good entrepreneurial person, set up and close the first deals, and then we move from that. So I think the big surprise is that how you don't really need to plan for everything all the time. Don't plan ahead. Just go out and do and make sure you have money to do it and try it live, push it live. Like developer says it, we work, we push live. And then we figure out. So go experiment, not not do much planning. You yeah. you don't have uh, you're not H and M you don't have that many stores to no, run no. out. No, we don't have. The, I don't think any company, especially that tries to grow fast from and are not super big, can afford to have a lot of people just sitting down doing slides and plan for stuff. And so now, tell me this, right? Like you're in Europe, you're clear European DNA, like European sales hubs. You're glo- you've managed yeah. to grow globally. You have global brands. How do you compete with let's say American companies, and there are a few in your world that are in location marketing services. Yeah. Some of them are reaching unicorn status as well. Yeah. How do you see your competitive edge and where do you go head to head and where do you try to go not yeah. head to head as a software to software uh, seller with some constraints, I would say, yeah. r- relative to unlimited funding, go big or go home, Silicon Valley yeah. style company yeah no yeah we never been like that we never did done the seed a round b round we didn't do that we raised money we had something to use it for uh and our on our home market which i will say is the eu and uk there, there are actually regulations that the american companies has have issues with gdpr and so on so that's been beneficial for us lately because they are, we have a lot of customers. They're just not savvy are, enough to nail the the no, data no, privacy. The, the, yeah, exactly. The ISO needs. certifications needed and so on. So we focus quite a lot of that. But that is not helping us on a global market. I think what we do well is that we build a very efficient company with quite little. We didn't raise much money at all. If you, talk, if you compare it to Silicon Valley, they would say we haven't even raised money. So... We have built an efficient company so we can have a, a, a good pricing. We also build a, a bigger customer success organization, I think, than most other tech companies in our industry. So we companies tend to stay around because they get the help they need. We often say that we are not the software as a service, we're more like service as a software because service is really important. But we still sell the software and we don't charge for the service. But you need to remember that service is important if you want customers. And for your case, it's because there's just the teams are understaffed. They have thousands of stores, right? If you could remove some of the hassle of some manual thing that they need to do during onboarding, for example. Yeah. It's a do it once type of service, but then it reduces the friction and the customer stick around. Is that how you're thinking about it? Yeah, exactly. That's how Mm -hmm. we think about it. Okay. So when so then but back to US you you're are you using some sort of clever guerrilla the underdog tactics to break in to the more competitive markets or are you just sticking to your knitting that hey like we're customers are happy we have these global global like European HQ brands yeah. originally that's what we're doing, to be completely honest. I don't know if my CEO will agree when I say this, but we're going to focus on head offices in more Europe. We're also getting strong in the UAE and so on. Mm-hmm. But we, my, my view on the US always for a European company, either you are so big and you have the money to buy a smaller company, like a competitor or similar company in the US, and you grow with that. Or you get picked up by an American company in the end as a European player. I've seen so many of my friends trying to do the start. They we are going to move over the head of sales and one of the founders. They're going to start in the US and then they pour a lot of money into it and it fails. I also seen success. Of course, we have from Sweden. We have you know Skype from back in the day, Spotify and so on, and Klarna. But it's more like a lottery ticket. It's so many, they have pours a lot of money going into the US and they fail. So we decided not to do that. Things might change, but for now. Unfortunately, like I guess the point, the core point is the like some of the markets to which you're exposed, they have more retail locations, more stores than the US yeah. market, right? So it's not yeah. like that. In that sense, people sometimes in America, we there's a kind of centricity to the America. Yeah. And they, so like it is, while it's easier as a single 
country sometimes yeah the, the we tend to forget the eu is a bigger consumer market has a has a broader infrastructure and then you're like you're pretty close to middle east middle eastern markets and other markets yeah. in terms of geography as well yeah. um and it's always like a us is always like a year a few years before europe that's just how it is we just need to deal with that technology wise <laughs> So we have also more competition in the U.S. and some of them are really good and we are friends with them and we talk to them and so on. And we see that it's easier for us to grow in other markets. And, th and this is really tacky to say, maybe, but it's better to be a big fish in a smaller pond than a really small fish in a big pond, which we would be in the U.S. So instead, we are like one of the top three in Europe. That's much better than trying to get to number one and see what happens with that. And so then back to then how do you def like and, and I think this is a great kind of maybe wisdom on like how do you defend yourself as you see US technology companies moving in the space what do you th see that here's the things that you can do now here's the things you could do in the long term to make sure this is a not you're not going to be supplanted by some sort of technological leap to AI based location marketing that has been developed in the last yeah. six months. Yeah. Now, what we do is, of course, to keep track of where the technology is going and make sure that we're up to date with everything technology wise. The other thing that I think is even more important to make sure that the custom base you have, we have almost a thousand customers now. We need to make sure that they're happy. That's more important. And they get the technology and whatever they need, not so much looking at where the whole industry is going. I see so many players, and this is something that happens in the U.S. As soon as something new and shiny pops up, they use it in, the, in their headline of the company. For example, they just change it to location marketing AI platform. Yeah. yeah, sure. But you have some generative AI that actually helps you write a really poor text. That's it. That's, you're yeah. not an AI platform. You're just using it to raise more money or whatever you're trying to do with it. We're trying to stick to what our customer wants. If they want AI, which we see now, they want some generative AI helping them write answers to reviews and stuff. We implement it, but we listen right. to our customers first because our customer base at the moment is so big. So they represent even they the represent what you care about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's less innovation, problems in search of solutions, if I can yeah. have summarize. And it's much more or, or technology in search of problems and solutions. It's yeah. more, hey, we are going to stick close. We have a large customer base potential. We're going to be intimate with these customers we're going to speak their language we're going to yeah. understand their local requirements we're going to support them globally because we're more multicultural in terms of our approach and then we're going to over like we while we stick stick to technology we're going to over deliver on the customer success as yeah. a differentiator yeah. well, great set of insights anything else that you're you'd love to share with our audience and also where can they find you daniel and what what's the best way to connect you can find me on linkedin daniel melkerson i don't know if it will type the in any text and so in your pod and, or you can happy to link uh, to my linkedin if you want we'll that's add fine. you in absolutely yeah. and uh, so that's and um, otherwise yeah the only thing i would like to share don't as we spoke about earlier i don't know if it was in the pod or before don't be afraid to suck at something new have fun with it and don't get stuck in old routines that's that's why yeah. i'm gonna become a rock you start a rock band just like you know in my <laughs> in my 40s <laughs> we're allowed to start bands in our 40s but we're only allowed to play in our own basement <laughs> there you go <laughs> Daniel, thanks so much for joining and sharing the, the perspective of building a successful global company from Europe. I think this is a series of podcasts that's super interesting to us because I think as the venture world for our audience and investment world is normalizing to seeing what's it like to build a company that is sustainable versus just venture backed. Some of the fundamentals of what you've shared with us on this call really matter. So thank you so much for joining and sharing that with our audience.